Welcome everyone. My name is Katie Nickel and I am an educator at the Ringling Museum. And today I am joined by our civil circus curator, curator of circus, uh, Jennifer Lemmer Posey, who's here to talk about portraiture and circus posters and how the ideas of self image um, in circuses of the past are still extremely relevant today. Today we're talking about the Ringling Brothers. And so without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Jennifer Lemmer Posey. Great. Thank you, Katie. So I think a lot about circus posters and the kind of imagery that are in them and, and Katie humors me and lets me talk about that and then throws good ideas my way. So as we've been working on the reinstallation of the circus galleries, we have one gallery that is dedicated to the story of the Ringling Family Circus. And one wall of that space is given over just to portraits of the five brothers who founded the circus. So I've been thinking a lot about, about these five men and how they chose to portray themselves to a, a broader culture in a way that would enhance their business but also keep with their character. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that today and uh, hopefully Katie and I will have some good ideas that bounce around through that. So to start off, I, I called this the Ringling Brothers building a family brand and brand obviously for business is so important. Uh, I would argue that any more brand maybe is important to all of us as we navigate social media. We think very much about how we present ourselves in the world. For the Ringling Brothers in the late 19th century, thinking about how you present yourself in the world was a little more limited. There weren't so many forms of mass media that they could share themselves through. So they had print media like newspapers and advertisements, and then obviously they had circus posters. So I'm, I'm thinking about these five men and how they used this media. Uh, it start with today. And a long time ago, I saw some talk about Target's brand, and it really stuck with me because you know, the minute you see even a red circle, like you can mess with this brand however you want, but you still know it's Target. The words Coca-Cola can be synonymous, at least in the South, um, with soda, right? It, it, you know, that brand is so strong. Band-Aids are the same kind of thing. We, we culturally have come to know certain products as, as being the representative of, of the whole type. I, I think, arguably in, in America at least, Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey for many people is circus. Even though Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey stopped performing in 2017, uh, we have at the Ringling Museum faced a lot of questions about what does it mean now that the circus is over? And I have to explain to people that the circus isn't over. One, one circus has stopped performing, but there are wonderful circus arts happening everywhere. But every time I answer that question, I am just blown away by how strong the brand is. Because even though circus is happening literally all around people all the time, the fact that Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey isn't on the road means for some people that there is no circus. So how did they get there? How did they manage to build a brand that has lasted over 140 years, uh, the Greatest Show on Earth brand is, is almost 150 years old um, starting next year. So that brand means so much and it's resonated for such a long time. And the brothers were stewards of it for a very long time as well and they kept it going. Uh, and they kept it going through print advertising. So this is, one, this is one of the best photos in our whole archives. It's a 1903, uh, photograph of a Ringling poster stand. And, and this is to kind of give an idea, if, if you can imagine going back to a time period where you didn't have easy access to the internet, where you couldn't be listening to me talk, uh, you couldn't even just see these images roll into your own home. There's no television. There's no radio yet. You really, like, the, the town you're in is what you have. And for the most part, it's got signs for businesses. You can see some in the back. But most of the year, it's a pretty humdrum place. It looks like it always did. And then suddenly one morning you wake up and the general store looks like this. Uh, except in color. I, I, I don't even know how to emphasize that enough. I mean, you have to imagine the beautiful, vivid blues and reds that are part of these posters. So that your, your whole town is transformed by these beautiful images. And not only is the color amazing and the, just the, the sheer number, but if I could zoom into these, you could see the, the kinds of things that you see in them, whether it is people from foreign countries or exotic animals 
or people flying through the air. Uh, the, the kinds of images you see are like nothing that you've seen before. Uh, so I always say that this was really the first part of the magic of Circus Day. And it was this kind of magic that inspired the Ringling Brothers to want to go into the circus business. Maybe, maybe not a uh, bill posting on quite this scale. They didn't print posters in this kind of number when the brothers were young, but it was print advertising that, that would have gotten them to the show in the first place. And they were aware of this from the very start. So I'm not gonna go into a long history of the Ringling Brothers. We do that in other places. It's enough to say that from the time that they were very young, they dreamed of owning their own circus. Uh, you can see here the five brothers who founded the show. There were seven Ringling Brothers altogether, but two of them just worked for the circus later on. Uh, Al Ringling in the upper left is the oldest of the brothers, and he was really Mr. Circus. He dreamed of performing. He taught himself how to walk on a rope, how to balance a plow on his chin, um, and how to juggle. And he, although he was able to, to do leather working like his father, he went out in the world and joined circuses and performed whenever he could. The other brothers, Otto in the upper right, Alf T in the lower right, Charles and John, each kind of came up younger. None of them performed outside of their own family show. It was only Al that kind of was so driven that he was gonna do that. Uh, Otto and John were very business minded. They were really about the money and how, how they could route the show and make it efficient and, and a good business. Charles and Alf were about the program and writing press releases. So each brother kind of had their place. This particular image is a piece of letterhead actually that, that must date from about 1887. So the brothers first went on the road in 1884. Um, so it gives you an idea really early on, they've already decided they need to promote themselves and they need to, to show how important they are, that the fancy frames around each one of their portraits, it, it tells you something about them. They've, they've gone to a great extent to, to make themselves look important, even though they look so incredibly young here. John would have been 21 if 1887 was the date. So they're, they're fresh into the world of circus, but they've already had a few successes. They're feeling good about things. So they've started to build their image. This was a pretty quick jump for them. So 1884 is that first year that the Ringling Brothers decided to go out in a big way. They'd played some town hall shows prior to that. But in 1884, they partner with an established showman, Yankee Robinson. And this herald that's in the Ringling Collection is, is one of the treasures of circus history, in my opinion, because it is the only time that you ever see the Ringling Brothers name under somebody else's. Uh, so we see the old Yankee Robinson and Ringling Brothers double show in circus. This, uh, they go out, they use Yankee Robinson's name because he is very well known. He was somewhat comparable to Barnum in the Midwest in this time period, and this is the time of Barnum. Um, so the Ringlings know that the way to get crowds is to give them a name that's recognized. So for the one season, they're out, they're doing very well with the show. Yankee Robinson dies in the middle of the season. The brothers finish it up. And after that, they never ever put their name under anyone else's again. So they were thinking about branding in this moment as to what was the advantage. And the advantage was to let Yankee Robinson be the lead in that. Uh, but as soon as they could, they put themselves forward in the world and proclaim themselves kings of the show world. Um, and I love this poster. This is from 1905. Uh, this is the year that the Ringlings have entered into a partnership with James Bailey. Bailey's partner Barnum had died quite a while before. Bailey himself had just recently come back with his show from a tour of Europe. And he entered into an agreement with the brothers first about routing their shows. It's, it's a long, complex story, but what they've realized is they need to work together. And so the Ringlings can tout that they're important enough that James Bailey of Barnum and Bailey has had to negotiate with them. And so taking this Kings of the Show World title is, is not a big leap for them anymore. What I think is remarkable when you think about the imagery of this is, is how they've presented themselves as a unit. And, and I really like this. As I mentioned earlier, each brother had his own personality. John was, was very flamboyant. He liked to be seen. He liked to be noticed in the world. And throughout his history, you, you see him seeking that limelight. 
Whereas some of the other brothers, Otto, for instance, really, really was very private. We don't know a lot about him because he didn't go out and announce very much. But what they thought was most important was that they were a unit. They were a family. And so they're all presented together. They, they all look in the same direction. They all offer a similar profile. You feel the unity in each one of these portraits, even though you can see that they're different people. Um, they chose this style of portraiture because they were, again, mimicking their greatest competition, Barnum and Bailey. This Barnum and Bailey poster is fantastic. James Bailey had it printed after, this would be a decade after Barnum had died. Uh, but again, the Barnum name is so big and so important. And James Bailey realizes, one in part because of his personality, he was very quiet and retiring like, like Otto Ringling was. Um, but more than that, it's just that Barnum had mesmerized America. And so even though he had been gone a long time, the circus that held his name was still thought of as representing the kind of wonders that were associated with Barnum. So Bailey issued this poster a year or so before the Ringling poster that you saw. Mm. And so the, the Ringlings, you know, realize that this is the way to go. We show ourselves, we let people know that we are good, moral, upright people. And this is, it's a tradition for them to keep these images of themselves. Um, I selected this poster because you see the brothers, this is the moment where they really realize that, that their show is going to make it because they're now op able to open in Chicago. So they're opening in Chicago. I think this one is a 1902, 1903 image. And you see all five of the brothers there across the top and, and all this beautiful text and the gigantic show that comes out behind. But it's the brothers over the top that are the brand that are what represent the Ringlings. Uh, this goes really well in Chicago. They, they do a great job. They're a Midwestern based circus at that point. They've come out of Wisconsin. And so Chicago is their major city and Barnum and Bailey hold New York. And so the brothers are a very well recognized kind of west of the Mississippi. When James Bailey dies and the brothers manage to buy the greatest show on earth, the Barnum and Bailey title, they decide that it might be interesting to, to flip and see if their show can take over New York. And so in um, 1908, you get this poster. The first time in New York, the Ringling Brothers, World's Greatest Shows. So instead of Barnum and Bailey opening at Madison Square Garden, which was a tradition that goes back, at that point it went back almost 50 years of Barnum shows at Madison Square Garden. So the brothers have put their own show and have sent Barnum and Bailey out to Chicago. This was a total dud. Like nobody in New York knew who the brothers were. They didn't understand where the Barnum and Bailey circus was. I think the response in Chicago was equally lukewarm. These, uh, these regions had come to recognize something in the shows that they felt like were theirs. And so trying to take over Madison Square Garden just wasn't a good fit. Um, I, I have to imagine this was a little bit of a crushing moment for the brothers. Um, even though they're there, unified together, uh, you know, to, to have achieved this pinnacle moment and, and not be just lavished with praise must have been a little bit of an ego killer. But they were businessmen before all other things, so they immediately go back and, and switch back to the standards where the, the Barnum and Bailey is in New York, the brothers are in Chicago, and they run the shows like that for almost a decade before they merge them. Uh, but I, I, you know, I think this is interesting to see how no matter how much you try and build your image, there are moments where <laughs> culture isn't ready for you to, to have that level of esteem or that moment of fame. Um, and they were reminded of that. In thinking about how the brothers kept this unified image, one of the strangest uh, press moments that I've come across are these mustache cups. So this, I picked up the photo from an Atlas Obscura uh, Ad because I didn't have ready access to a, a copy. This image comes from some press material that was released about the Ringlings in the early 1900s. They are not, to my knowledge, actual cups that the brothers used. It was this idea that they're known for their mustaches, for their beautiful mustaches. And these kinds of cups really did exist and were used to protect 
to protect the hair from the tea so you you could still look presentable while sipping your tea um, and so so as it's kind of unified front they've created these mustache mugs for all the brothers and and again, it, there's just enough of a evidence that they each have their own personality. You know, they don't uniformly all look exactly the same. They've, they've given Al off to the right this kind of big swirly name because he was the showman. John is a little more practical. He's the businessman that routes things. Um, and even the sizes of the, the mustache ledge vary, um, I, I guess, depending on the size of the brother's mustaches. So, um, I, I think it's kind of funny the things we latch onto as being um, the symbols that hold us together. And I think it's really wonderfully strange that we chose the mustache mugs for the brothers. So coming back around to remind you of, of this image and the different characters in them. Um, as I mentioned, they're, they're very different individuals. And as they pass away, um, Otto was the first to pass away and then Al, and Alf T, then Charles, and John Ringling, who's the founder of the Ringling Museum, was the last of the brothers. Um, so as much as we saw John as part of this unit of five, when he spends his, the last decade of his life as the last, the last of the Ringling brothers, even the other two brothers had passed away at this point, um, he is very much a man of his own. At that point, as we know at the museum, he has established himself in the business world. He is doing deals in railroads and in oil. He owns property in several different parts of the country. He's traveling on his own private railroad car and, and putting that into the news whenever possible. So he's really built up this image of himself as an individual. And yet ultimately, I think what he was proudest of was the fact that he and the brothers had built this business together. As a kind of closing thought about how they built their imagery into the brand and posters. Uh, we've seen over and over again these five heads and how they keep that in all of their advertising. So this poster is from 1910 and you see in the upper left this little oval where they've got all the brothers that are there in a row and, and most of the posters from that season had that same portrait oval in there so that everybody could see that it's truly the Ringling Brothers show, it's a good quality show, you can trust them and here are the brothers to prove it. In 1911, when Otto dies, the brothers actually pay to have these little tiny ovals printed with the word the and pasted over all of the portraits because it's no longer all five of them. So, so this idea of the unity of the five is, is broken and they don't want to false advertise in any way to, to the audiences. So you can see in the poster in this image, there's a little bit of wrinkling around the word the. That's a poster in the collection that truly has a pasted over piece. And if we were to peel off the, the, the poster, the oval would be there in place with all five of the brothers. But without Otto, they didn't want to continue that imagery. So that's a little bit about the Ringling Brothers. I think that's so fascinating, um, going back to the first video in the series, where when one of the brothers passed away, the remaining four felt uncomfortable continuing to use his image, and so they just abandoned the image of the five. They, it's not like they even took him out, you know, they went in a totally new direction. And that's so different from the way that Barnum was having his image used, and uh, the way you made it sound, you know, would have been, would have been totally fine with Bailey profiting off his image because his image was still out there. Yeah. Very, very different mentality there. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think some of it may have almost been more personal in a way. I mean, I think Bailey having Barnum's image living on with his, mm -hmm. while it seems from what we can tell that the two of them got along quite well, um, th there wasn't that kind of close connection. So I, I don't know if it might have actually just been emotionally difficult for the brothers to be advertising their show with Otto when Otto wasn't there. You know, if there actually was kind of a heartstring moment to that. But I do think even if that's part of it, another part is what they based their whole business on, which is this kind of truthful moral show. Um, was something we hadn't gotten into too much before is that 
the circus had always suffered from this idea that itinerant shows were a little bit questionable, right? I mean, for a long time, religious groups in the mid 19th century really discouraged communities from going to the circus because they felt like it was a bad influence. Um, and so Barnum worked somewhat to, to change that, but the Ringlings really, really based a lot of their business on having a good reputation. Uh, they were proudly called a Sunday school show because they wouldn't allow any kind of crime on their circus lot. Nobody was allowed to pick pockets or um, it was known on some lots that you could sell tickets and not, and give change, but not give proper change. And then, pro you know, take the, that off to the side. And the Ringlings wouldn't allow any of that on their lot. They made it clear from the start. And so people felt safer coming to their shows. And that's, again, part of the reason for having your portrait there is, you know, saying, I'm a, I am a moral upright person. And maybe, maybe saying that times five made the shows seem that much more safe um you know that this was a good family they not only was one person behaving well but the family was a good family yeah it makes it it makes me think of like modern day influencers you know like instagram influencers who have built their brand on their visual identity on who what they look like on on how they act where they go um much like the ringlings and then to think you know when you do start seeing ads from your influencers you know are you more apt to trust them? That that's a good product because someone that you have grown to get to know through their imagery, you know, can you trust that product now? And I think it opens a lot of questions about, you know, is that kind of truth telling? Is that honesty still something we see in, in imagery today? Yeah, oh no, that's a fascinating way to look at it. Honestly, if you think about it from these two historical stories, because I, I think you're right, I mean, I know, that my family with young people, a lot of times there are things that they'll want because yes, this person who they follow on Instagram has it or something like that. Um, you know, the Ringlings take their portraits off when Otto's gone because maybe they feel like that would be false advertising to say that these five people tell you this is good when it, it can't be that. On the other hand, Bailey keeps Barnum on the posters for more than a decade, um, you know, and. I don't mean to say that Bailey necessarily thought it was okay to delude people with, with Barnum's imagery, but right. he had no problem with that. And, and actually what we know of Barnum himself as a showman, Barnum probably wouldn't have had a problem with it either. Yeah, it's just interesting how imagery is so personal. Um, each person seems to interpret it differently and put it out differently. It's a very subjective topic. Yeah, well, and, and our comfort level with having our image out in the world. Um, again, I think Barnum, you know, from, from our previous conversations, Barnum really enjoyed being recognized. This mm -hmm. idea that all across the country, people could see his face and know who he was. I, I don't know that all five of the Ringlings necessarily felt that way. Some of them might, um, but I think it was the, the, the business obligation of this is how we do it right. This is, we, we build our image into our business because that's what you do more so than I want to be famous. Mm. Yeah, they were more concerned about putting on a good show, running a good business, it mm. sounds like, than they were about fame in and of itself. Yeah, absolutely. They, they, were, they were about the circus. That was, that was their focus. I love that. Well, Jennifer, thank you for sharing a little bit about the Ringling Brothers and, and how they portrayed themselves and some of their goals in advertising. I know I learned a lot. Uh, it's made me think pretty deeply about the way that I, <laughs> the way that I put my own image out on the internet. Uh, have to think a little bit more about Otto, who is a little more private, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> but thank you very much for joining me. Uh, and we will talk in our next video very soon. So stay tuned for that.